my name is Robert Schuller. I'm a retired professor of English from this university. Uh, and I'm, I've been asked by the Department of English and Philosophy and Literature Committee to make this presentation, and I'm honored to do so. We want to thank Dean Ray Hayes of the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences. I wrote the manuscript. And the Department of English and Philosophy for making this reading possible. William Staub was a winner of the 19, 2006 National Poetry Series for his book, Nervous Systems, published by Penguin Books, which has also published his most recent collection of poems, Absentia. <coughs> Internationally and nationally, Penguin is considered to be one of the most significant publishers of poetry. In America, William Staub joins poets like John Ashbery, and Walden, uh, John Logan, and many others. The poems of William Staub cleanse our eyes and minds, open them to the strange wonders near us, or I might say by the limits. And the even stranger, wider worlds just beyond our apparent grasp. William Staub makes us see anew and think. I prize his unflinching honesty, his integrity, his willingness to struggle with experiences that baffle him, and probably most of us. His compassion, <coughs> I would have to say for all living things, and maybe for all things. His loves, his quests for truth, even when they become unsettling. I am in awe of his creative. <coughs> Thank you, William Stott. Of 
of fascination and moments that we have where we understand a pie up there. And uh, where we understand and feel like, um, and, and recognize that we're in something bigger than, than, uh, you know, than ourselves and our, our usual contexts. And, and this is an experience like that. It happened to me in downtown La Crosse, Wisconsin, where I live. Cloud out of square. From the top of the city bakery pours an enormous cloud of steam. Even when it's warm out and calm, up through industrial oven hoods, circular cluster of hook-shaped vents, a metal bow streaming ribbon on a stucco gift. But today, at wind chill minus 15, heat and bread scent billow, panic white inside out into blue, flatten over Cass Street to rapidly cool, curl on a downdraft the old hotel, splash on pavement and rush across the intersection all around me. Um, there's a theory of, of poetry. I, I, I think of poetry as an art form. I think, I think poetry is an art. It's, a, it's, it's writing. I think it's art um, in the way that it works with the material of the world. It's similar to other things that you would call art, like dance and music and film and picture making. I think of it as an art in the way that I practice it. Um, and there's a theory of art that the that the piece of art is the is really just the trace of the act of making it. And so all art is performative in its moment. And even writing, when you sit down to write, is a performance. Your performance of the act of writing creates the trace, which is the piece. Um, and this is a poem that I think of in that way. Um, it's just a poem that has the kind of the story of its making in it. And, um, and it will maybe give you a sense. I feel like it gives a good sense of who I am as a writer and how I, how I work. It's called Written While Filling the Kiddie Pool. So that my children, when they arrive, will have warm water to splash in, hose over lip, water drum plastic. Lives of the vice presidents, I begin, drawn to some glimmer in their distant names, Fillmore. Van Buren, Schuyler Colfax, and Chester Arthur. Maybe 10 minutes while it's filling. Presidents face the challenges of their office while the vices nearly govern. Pen memos, forget capitals, blunder into pistol duels in misty forests. The afternoon sun warms shallow water as a vice president nods off in a vestibule, and I too recline beside a young maple. The turtle-shaped pool nearly full, the vice poem settles per second. Oh well, no big poem. It was really nothing, goes the song. But then, it was your life, it goes, and that's kind of a bummer. Sitting in a smallish circle of shade, in a larger circle of failed ideas. The children will arrive, or are arriving. That arriving's begun and I only have to wait. Classic mistake. Planting this sapling, I confronted many wrong ideas about the ground. Hades, Mole Man, China down there, and China Syndrome. One thing's true, you can't just dig for fear of puncturing the mythical and the actual fabric of buried wire you could call Persephone's panties, or not. But you do call a hotline, and the next day, flags appear. The future arrives, all clear for digging. As current might overwhelm a body, children shatter the latch, pour through the garden gate. Aaron Burr's bullet unwinds Hamilton's alternate feature. Squiggly lines buzz up the arms, hair straightens, ears smoke. Children pause midair as if thinking made plastic swimming pools, maple trees. Time stills as water equals its container, then exceeds and spills into now. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, 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 this book, 
this book um, is, is my second full-length collection. My first one I worked on for like 15 years and actively tried to publish it for about five. And, uh, and it contains poems from about 15 years of writing. And so when it got accepted for publication, I was a little baffled as a writer. I just wasn't sure what I was doing. I would write things, but I no longer was targeting them toward this manuscript that I had been working on for a long time. So the things I would write, I just couldn't see what they, I couldn't see how they fit into anything, and I, and I, I was a little of a swim for a while. And then um, a terrible thing happened that became the center of gravity for a second, for the second collection. In one fall season, in about six weeks, there were uh, six uh, friends, colleagues, relatives uh, of mine who died, and I had never experienced this kind of a flurry of mortality before, um, and maybe that was just my good fortune. You know, I, I'm sure it was. Um, but suddenly, I had six, you know, six funerals in six weeks, and some of them were expected, and several of them were not. And um, and after that, uh, I was I lived with a new sense of what absence means, and the paradox of absence and the manifestations of absence on a daily basis. Absence is a paradox because it's not absence. You know, the absence is a word that can, that can have no right meaning. Um, because to signify anything, there has to be a presence of the meaning of the word. The word itself signifies a presence. And so, you know, you, you start to live with this idea of absence and encounter the daily manifestations of it. And, um, and that just became the, the center of gravity for the, for the poems I was writing. And it gave you know, this book a reason to be. Um, this next poem I want to read is two poems. It's a, it's, a, it's a poem in verse, and then it's kind of a postscript that's in prose. Uh, recounts one of a, of a couple of experiences that I had in, the, in those weeks that were just strange encounters and challenging for me, challenging for me as a person who's you know, generally speaking, a rationalist and, um, and uh, not prone to, uh, you know, any Tebow-esque uh, ideas of God's daily presence in my life, I guess. Um, and, and so I had some experiences that, that were challenging for me, and this is about one of them. It's called Blue in Nature and Some Overflow. And it's written in memory of Earl Maderi, who was a religious studies uh, scholar and who died of pancreatic cancer at 41. Uh, Blue in nature and some overflow. A year later, I ride through the marsh. A goose hisses at me. A heron flees the racket my bike trailer makes. I hadn't thought of you yet. I had to run Hawaiian punch to my daughter's school and grocery shop for Anna's graduation. I had to try once or twice to stay positive. When Claire called to tell me we'd forgotten her luau, I didn't get angry, maybe one second. A dog came bounding over hillocks of marsh grass growing around root balls and trunks decomposing. It wasn't scary. Some kind of hound probably practicing birding only these birds weren't shot. I thought of you only after the trail submerged. Luckily, my trailer has good clearance, but my shoes got soaked. Would you have thought to put your shoes in the trailer? I think you would have. I did not. Only after that bracing adventure did I cross the bridge, look down <coughs> at the overflown oxbow, and remember you securing your canoe to get up on a gnarly deadfall and help Andy and me clear a gap that wasn't nearly as narrow as we were making it seem. You came back to me clearly, feeling really good, you said, meds were effective. When one of those little birds you see, a million of, but only individual ones, rarely, Glimpses of the bird world much more than how do you do, hi, singular bird. I know you now, we're fine acquaintances and friends for life. Jigged away from whatever it was snacking up right off the pavement. I was riding easy, no rush, just busy in my head, with you feeling so good, relatively close in time to my talking to your corpse on the sofa in the side room. 
And it jigged up and away from my approach, then, in a pretty tight moment, snapped back to take one more bite. I guess it was really good, and it knew it had plenty of time. I was happy to see, as I remembered you, the bird pose for the briefest interlude, vividly blue. Some overflow. This thinking overflows the poem about how musical it was, the zigzag the bird made in its deft fly away and then back, and its clear momentary pose all made me think how like instruments we are played by perception and consciousness. I turned the bike and trailer around, rode back, and found the bird again. It had an ample source of food and seeds fallen on the trail. We're right in the middle of a late spring, a late spring bloom, so I was sure I'd find it again, and I did. And when I managed to get close enough to see it clearly a second time, I thought and felt that the bird was only itself now. In that first moment when its performance blew through me, it had been more, not it had signified more, though I know it's absurd to argue that I didn't interpret it. It was more than itself. It was bright arpeggios separated by an eighth note rest. It was you, Earl. But in the second instance, it was itself only. Of course, it has its own life, I thought. These thoughts about how the dead are with us, the mechanism of it, though that sounds awful. Maybe the instrumentation of it, the ways we're blown through the larger harmonic. Maybe the dead play the symphony of the living, though after I wrote, at the Afterlife Hotel, I started really hating metaphors about what the dead are doing. I wanted to think of the dead very physically, strung through the ground and plants and air and blood. And then I think of you, and blue appears in nature, physical blue, even a blue flower, but in this case better, an animate creature, softly textured and coming still, as if to present itself as blue in response to the thought, so precious as it dropped from some richer sphere. This thinking overflows, as maybe living overflows. Um, I want to say just a couple words about magazine that I work for. It's called Conduit. It's a literary magazine. I'm on the editorial staff of it. It's a great magazine. There are copies outside of <coughs> stainless steel cart with wheels on it. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's, I feel really, uh, I, I joined the editorial staff in, in 2008 and um, I just feel really flattered to be part of it. It's a uh, um, Really unique journal, mostly dedicated to poetry, but it also reprints visual arts and does interviews in association with a theme for each issue. This new issue that I have here is called Nightlight, How the Moon Made Us Human, and it, it, it includes a um, interview with the astronaut Buzz Aldrin, uh, who recently appeared on 30 Rock, it was pretty funny, and also appears in the new Transformers movie. Um, and and uh, it includes art by Edward Hopper, Andy Warhol, poems by Daryl Weir, um, David Lehman, Alice Notley, uh, translations of uh, French poetry by Henri Michaud. Um, just a lot of great material. And um, in, in uh, the interview with Buzz Aldrin, Buzz says something interesting that's just germane to the a little bit to the next poem I'm going to read. It. And it's a thought, it's a, something to think about, and I just want to share it with you. Um, it might be interesting to think about the essential cancellation of the space program that seems to be in progress currently, and what that says about how things have shifted in terms of our national government and its essential lack of vision. What happened to that vision that came with the lunar launch? Could it be that the cancellation of the space program represents an eclipse of the vision that is able to see ourselves in a much larger setting and that all life on the planet is interconnected. And I just think that's a profound thought. 
that, um, you know, I, and I want to stay 100% out of the debate about um, whether the space program is something that should be funded when, you know, people are starving and we're at war, et cetera. Like, I'm not involved in the argument. But the essential point that is important to remember, you know, the larger um, and wider business that's going on out there um, is crucial, and that's a point that I would stand 100% behind. Um, and if the space program was, was something that helped us, you know, as a species to stay in touch with the vastness that we are in, then I think that's, you know, that's an important function. Um, uh, anyway, mainly the, uh, the issue is poems, and it's not, you know, particularly political or anything like that. Mainly it's poems um, centered on human experience of, you know, of the night sky and, and, and that kind of thing. It's pretty cool. You should take a look at it at least. If you want to buy one, you can buy one. If you, just, you know, if you don't have any money, but you really want one, uh, just say something nice to me and I'll probably give you one. <laughs> Um, this poem is called Poem on Earth. It's dedicated to my mom. For half an hour, we had that kind of snow where there's so much moisture in the air and the air is so cold that each flake's crystal system is elaborate lace and surprisingly large. <coughs> my sympathies to radiology technicians working in below-ground medical facilities and dedicated attendants of presidential escape routes, standing all day at their secret posts with everything slung on their belts. Pagers, mag lights, nine millimeter issue. Nothing ever happens if their pants are falling down. Remember, people living in subways sometimes choose below over the quote unquote attractions of this level. Remember, in outer space, a handful of overachievers with amazing respiratory systems manage experiments and maintenance on the International Space Station. I read about them, getting ready to spacewalk, hearing different songs each day as they wake to their remoteness. I imagine their cheeks all rosy when they return. They're happy, but it's hard readjusting to gravity and trying to talk to their families when they can't say exactly how it was out there. You should have seen it. I wish you could have seen it, Mom. Um, yeah, I think I'll put absentia away. So, say goodbye. Goodbye. outside if you want to take a look at it again or pull it up or snag it um, There's a, you know, a famous, very famous line um, from a poem that says, beauty is truth. Truth is beauty. And uh, uh, people argue about that line a lot. Uh, some people say it's a terrible line. It's the worst line in the poem, some people say. <laughs> and then other people say it's the only good line in the poem. So I don't know about that. Once again, I want to stay out of that debate. But I think it's a profound thing um, to think about how the world that's presented to us is beautiful and how the beauty we experience is the world that, that's presented to us. Um, one time in my life, I wanted to. I, I, I feel. I really think this is all true. Only one time in my life did I ever sit down with the express purpose of trying to write a poem that was strictly beautiful, with no content specifications. There was no story I was trying to get at. There was no material or or any particular inspiration that I was that I had started from. I sat down and I said to myself, I want to write something that is truly. That is beautiful. Uh, and period. That's it. My only goal. And um, I don't know. A lot of things fail. And um, you know, probably fail. I like it still. It's called Fugue. It's in this book, Nervous Systems. Um, it's called Fugue. 
A fugue is both a uh, musical structure and uh, also a description of a disordered state of mind. Mental disorder. Fugue. Hospital copter skates south above the river. Urgency and ease in its glide and rotor hum. Out of town, a girl has given her arms to a thresher, or a passenger rests half through a windshield. Once, a truck full of police with clear plastic shields sped away from city center, past a row of shops over basement apartments where tenants ring chimes and light candles enshrined every day. Once, this place was on fire. Once, underwater. Once, this place hurtled through a sudden dream of light and heat, in form unprecedented in matter, all becoming of song. Tower chimes, and no one fails to adore its orchestration. Songs pass in light, traffic. Arrangements slide toward jaywalkers, cafe loiterers. All surfaces tend to beautiful noise. When lovers set the glass pipe down on the bedstand of the rented room, a shaft of street light plays smoke and skin. They exhale and descend into body. Pace and pitch evolve. A pattern of days drawn like a bow over strings. A round wind in the throat of an oboe. In the street, a wash of sound. The cathedral brings the hour. I take steady breath come to posture. Um, this is a different poem. It's called Poem for Detroit. It's, uh, it's about storm chasing, essentially, which, um, which I used to actually do, you know, and now there are cable shows about it. I just think, damn it. <laughs> Another opportunity gone by the wayside. Um, oh God. That Reed guy is way too intense anyways. You ever watch that show? <laughs> Poem for Detroit. High Plains car chase game. Race to connect with isolated storms running the horizon. Drive state highways, county roads, any old dirt track to get yourself right in weather. Once I hit washboard at 70, my olds leapt from one gravel edge to the other. The steep margin had a kind of gravity, and I understood I would be found after some time. One artist cast every part of a wrecked American sedan, reassembled it without the death. One less roll over in rain than bleed out humming the Supreme's death. Or one more not that. This blonde Montana kid I knew played trumpet with the temptation to his Bozeman. Past their prime, they stepped off the tour, bu tour bus in red velvet suits and did groove. See how wherever else it goes, out and out, it reaches Detroit to fall through auto motion into new music. Air is made for Motown. Air gets everything down to its pump, broken valve, pooling fluids, eventually First hard drops smack the smoking chassis, or if it never does rain, maybe a bird. What the wind sounds like, blown over cooling. The point of chasing storms is to meet before being unmade. One weather, one car, one body. Me as in meteorology. If you ever play and win, get out of the car. Let the cold rain hammer you some. Um, how many of you are, I don't know, are you, how many of you young people are writers? Yeah. <laughs> Go. Nice. Okay. Some of you are and you just don't want to raise your hand. 
Other, I understand that. Others of you uh, aren't. Never written a word. Not one in your life. Uh, this, I just want to read this poem because it's one of the very first poems I ever wrote. And after uh, a really long time of like going back to it every once in a while and going, how come this never gets published? Um, it finally did get published and, uh, and ended up being the, um, the oldest poem in my, in my, my first book. And it was you know, something that I started when I was probably 19 or 20. And um, kept it around, you know, like I just kept it around in the things that I was, in the, in, the, in the other things that I was working on, you know, I didn't obsess about it, but when I would put a, a collection of poems together for some reason, I would go back and look at those old poems and I would grab that one out. And um, just, you know, if you have those things, those pieces that stick in your head, keep them around. You know, it doesn't hurt. Nothing might ever happen with them, but you never know. Um, it's called The New Development, and it starts with a drink of water and a um, epigraph from the Bhagavad Gita. All the Upanishads are the cows. It's been pasture land for a century, but these 30 foundations, these 30 new frames, will be called river hills. The houses must be valuable out of town aways. But the lots are small, so it's easy to imagine the tangled network of neighborhood secrets. Today I saw an owner move a red flag stick six inches toward the adjacent parcel. Last Friday, I saw two boys kissing in the shell of what might become a den, the end of that day's sun on the hand, pushing the shoulder down. I turned back, sat on a front loader, and waited while the sun sank. After a while, an engine turned, headlights made a maze of the framed out dusk, and dust in the taillights intensified the sky's last deep shade of orange. I decided then, my River Hills estate would be in the south circle, concrete patio facing the adjacent pasture. Every cow name I've forgotten. The names for the white, the brown red, the black and white ones. I will learn those again in order to call upon their nonchalance. Even with cement mixers, power saws, kids slinging rocks and firing BBs into the herd, even at night, when the highway lights streak the pasture like sideways lightning, they keep their cool. They're simply cows, even when it seems they should be edgy cows. <laughs> Maybe they find it funny, like a carnival ride, like a carnival in town with tents and hoopla, or a toy of simple progression, mechanical figures crossing and dumping and hollering, structures rising. At night, the fast movers stop and go away. This one guy comes and shuffles around. Uh, and I'll read the last poem in this book, too. Uh, it's called Five Years After Watching the Perseids with a Friend. It's, um, you know the Perseids, that meteor shower that we, our orbit goes through every August. It's essentially just a dust cloud in outer space, but our orbit passes through it, so it's called a meteor shower. Um, uh, this is a poem about um, venturing out to see that. It's worth doing if you haven't. This August, streams run high and fast down from Mount Evans, many days bringing bodies. Death by water is everyday news here. We all imagine it. A careless moment before the fast sweep and cold. The cold and the confusion and the coming up. More than that summer week at your cabin, the seclusion, our afternoon drinking vodka on the quiet beach, nights floating on separate rafts watching, me watching meteors leap away from Perseus into darkness. More than what we said about love and death, looking into the water, I remember you dropping me off at my parents' home. The car door closed and I walked up the drive alone. 
wind charged the pines, the grass needed water. It's become a photo to me. My simple form, back turned, head down. What could I have been thinking? It's no use trying. My familiarities are so changed. The shapes and colors around me provide not even the memory of a feeling. In Salinger, sometimes, I find a recollection of our impossible situation, the usual wish for multiple resolutions. But, friend, it's tiring, straining to recall. Here, my balcony overlooks a basin longer than the rest of our days. Last night, I watched a moth struggling at the curb. The traffic whispered yes. Rain fell, and the streams rose. We all looked west, the shadow of a mountain. Okay. I'd like to read just a few um, new poems. They might be bad. Things fail. I said that already. <coughs> um, another failure. The, the dream of perfect pants. This morning I dreamed of perfect pants. They looked like regular pants sometimes. But they were responsive, like a mood ring. So they became whatever you needed. Yes. I knew it was a dream because I had worked in a regular office and I went out at night to swanky clubs with hip friends who complimented me on my pants. You know how dreams are like reality on steroids? These pants kept revealing their properties in scenarios that morphed and overlapped. I was dancing with this Betty Grable lookalike, and my pants kind of glistened under the disco ball. And then my pockets filled with birds that flew into orbit, where I triggered my pants' special magnets and solved the global problem of space debris. <laughs> At the office, I spoke to the assembled sales force. Too long we've been shackled by ordinary things. It's time to set loose our dreams. People laughed, I guess, because it was a dream. But my pants became angry and vaporized the sales force. And strangely, the image of that moment became the catalog ad for Power Pants, which was branding I had not approved. In response to my subsequent frustration, my pants became massaging pants. And in response to my subsequent arousal, my pants became intimate pants. And in response to my subsequent confusion, my pants gave counseling. As I became perfect, my pants became messi messianic, attracting disciples. I felt at that point the pants should become rows, but no dice. In this dream, pants were pants. I felt myself begin to wake then, comforted by the reassuring sense that categories on some level hold. If one thing were another, nothing would mean anything, everything, nothing. I um, enjoy a really wide variety of music, and um, I especially uh, lately have liked uh, listening to some old, like, wordy, I, I'm, so, I'm, I'm a total novice, like, I enjoy music, but I don't know anything about it, so pardon my descriptor. But I, lately I've been enjoying some really, like, wordy, singy kind of jazz. <laughs> What's that? Wordy, singy. Like um, Mose Allison and Chet Baker when he sings, and Ken Nordine when he does these word jazz things that are just essentially poems with music and weird sounds behind them, and I think that that perfect pants poem um, this just really comes out of my desire to be as cool as those cats. Oh, that's not what I said cats. <laughs> um, this poem I really like. It's a recent poem, and I think it may be, I don't know. Um, I, I just really like it. I think it's, it's really good. So don't tell me otherwise. <coughs> 
Um, it's called A Moment for Authentic Shine. This is the greatest moment of your life, said the voice, both familiar and distant, like a childhood friend become spokesperson for a cleaning product, which caused many hats to turn in many directions and one robed arm to extend. And what, after all, had been passing? The sounds birds made often seemed more cogent than the swirl of argument, a cyclone in a sandbox. So much management we ought to have degrees was a type of joke made at outmoded parties. Still with the shades and the declarations, echoes of heroic solos translated out of urgent decades, while almost unnoticed, pensive tunes accumulate in the mix like thunderclouds on these warmer days. Regardless, the names come unpinned, stars die, a closet full of semi-recognizable jackets and hats bespeaks the bygone, and yet the baffling rekindling of romance may justify the maintenance of a hairstyle. A certain heart medication, no. I was afraid to say, a certain heart beating in the chest of a certain girl. To say heart in that trite way, and girl when by now she's 50, and real when the elapsing of all things into void has been made abundantly clear. But I knew her, and she seemed real, and at 30 still childlike, a trait adorable in women, rather of concern in men, say the conservatives, but look who's ogling the ball players around the pool table. Any slogan invites rebuttal, and a spin into personal views often doubles futile conversation. One might live consuming nothing but packaged goods, and still in that moment of late afternoon crash, overheated, nauseated by the persistence of sexual memory, blinded by sun, buffeted by wind, unfairly rely on that prideful sense of authenticity, so prized in our time that it can be said to float, invisible of course, above a century's worth of steaming wrecks. Cloud of elemental and reckless identity, unwarranted, silver-lined illusion of nobility, until geographies choke in the torrent, shrines assembled from knickknacks manufactured by prisoner children dissolve, and in our true magical forest, blossoms wreathed by small creatures that worked in tandem with our spirits become, as we become, atmosphere. Mm. Okay, one more, and then I'll let you go consult your brackets. Get on your big badger suits in time for the basketball game. Um, keeping it real. OK, I do like your cat picture. I also like the current air temperature as per its ability to freeze pond water into an ice rink in my backyard. And viewing those recent scenes of officers lined up for graduation, all lean and clean shaven, I like thinking their orderly craniums are containers for something like solar systems. Giant dispersals alive at all points, wirelessly connected like Tesla coils by energies we can never... Yada yada. In his Boston accent, my grandfather told me, this world will crush your nuts like a garbage disposal. That's not a memory. It's not real. And yet, there it is. I like the idea of a quiet point at the center, the I, the singularity, where the real resides. And yet, you are not a cat, my friend, my worthy adversary. You can't fool me with a picture like that. If you haven't noticed, the pond water's freezing because of a hundred billion covalent bonds spinning in transition around points of immeasurable gravity. This permeable world is not quite infinitely perforated, so even if you showed up now in a whiskery cat costume, paused to remove your skate guards, and then skated graceful figure eights with your tail curled and your paws thoughtfully clasped behind your back, I would not believe in you. I wouldn't.
Thanks again, Joan, and thanks, Bob. I think there may still be um, food and refreshments out back. Um, although I think I did hear a pack of ravenous coyotes um, out there. Um, but thanks for coming out and uh, stick around and chat.